Okay, so now to finally get to the results that they found in this study. What we're looking at here is table 3, which is on page 490, and they are measuring, they use the um, specific, or the, the ellipse area for each of these species, and they want to compare uh, that area of the fish when it's in allopatry, so this is a measure of its niche, and they want to compare the the niche when it's allopatric, when it's by itself, to these other conditions where it's grown sympatrically with carp, sympatrically with goldfish, sympatrically uh, between carp and goldfish. Now notice that there's a dash here because that doesn't have anything to do with the niche of this species, so that's that's why there's a dash. So they want to compare all of these niche spaces, so these are 95% confidence intervals of the niche of this species when it's by itself versus when it's competing with one species, competing with another species, or when competition is really strong, even stronger, stronger still. And what you see is that the 95% confidence intervals, let's just take, uh, let's take this condition here these numbers overlap with these numbers enough so that um, statistically there's no difference. So the area of the niche is about the same all through this column. Same thing goes for carp. There are no differences when it's by itself versus all of these other conditions. No dif difference for goldfish when it's by itself versus all these other conditions. So the conclusion that they reach here in this table is that they all overlap within a treatment. Each one of these treatments overlaps with when they're grown allopatrically, so there are no differences in niche size for any of these species. So what does that mean for the three predictions? Well, the most relevant prediction here is prediction number one, where they said inter-specific competition should alter the size of the niche and reduce growth. Well, they don't actually have any detectable impact on niche size, so that disagrees with their first prediction. In figure one, this one is a little complicated. Um, I'm going to walk you through a few different areas on it. First of all, each one of these panels is for a different species, and I've got them labeled here. They don't in the picture, but they do explain it here in the legend. And within each species, we've got that species grown allopatrically with the addition of one species, with the addition of another species, and um, then grown interspecifically at three different levels. So just to remind you, um, according to the study design that I showed earlier on, we've got um, this orange uh, brace right here. These two treatments are when they're in sympatry. This is the substitutive treatments. And here in the with the green brace, these are the additive competitive treatments. Now the other thing that makes it a little complicated is that we've got two y-axes. So here's the primary y-axis, here's the secondary y-axis, and it's the same axis for each of the three figures. The primary y-axis is a measure of the isotopic ratio for nitrogen 15 the secondary y-axis for each one of these figures is the isotopic ratio for carbon-13. And carbon-13 is shown in open circles, and nitrogen-15 is shown in all of the closed circles. So a lot going on. But let's just take one panel at a time. So the um, if we just look at the nitrogen-15 value right here when tench is grown allopatrically. This nitrogen 15 ratio, remember again, this is this has to do with the, the trophic position of the fish, um, and it's about the same for most of these treatments except for when it's grown with carp and when it's grown at really high interspecific competition. So everything with the little star, also called an asterisk, is when it's different from uh, when they're grown allopatrically. And here, um, 
when they're in competition with one other species, there is a slight difference versus down here. Um, so there's only a couple treatments, only a couple cases where there are significant differences for uh, the nitrogen 15 ratio. Similarly, there are only a couple differences for the carbon 13 ratio, and those are indicated here, um, here, and here, for example. So only when interspecific competition is really strong do they see the most reliable differences. The other other times they're sort of here and there, you know, here's one, here's one, but there's not one. So the the real big differences seem to happen only when interspecific competition is the strongest. And so the take home message of this figure with all of its panels is that inter and intraspecific competition seem to have different effects. And that there seems to be some divergence in niche use, but only in cases where interspecific competition is the strongest. Not so much um, when there's intraspecific competition. So does that result match the predictions that they made? Well, prediction two was that impacts from intra and interspecific competition will have similar impact on size and position of the niche of native species. Well, they don't really have that. They show that inter and intraspecific competition actually had different effects on the trophic position. So that also doesn't really agree with what they had expected. So that takes us to figure two, and figure two is also a little bit crazy, but we'll walk through it, it won't be too bad. So we've got four different treatments here. Here is tench growing allopatrically, so just by itself, kind of that reference condition. So this dashed circle is intraspecific competition that's elevated, and that's when there's 12 individuals as opposed to just eight individuals um, by itself. So this is slightly higher levels of intraspecific competition here. And here we have interspecific competition that's kind of strong, interspecific competition that's a little bit stronger. So there's four of all three species here and eight of all three species here. And what that's showing is the isotopic niche. So it's a measure of the area of um, the C13 ratio and this is essentially the the nitrogen 15 ratio. And so again, try to think of this as sort of like a two-dimensional niche for the kinds of things that they eat when they are by themselves. So when they're by themselves, this is kind of a representation. When you add higher levels of just that one species, there is kind of a shift over here. When you add a competing species, they sort of shift in a different direction. So it's kind of like their niche is moving. And here their niche is moving even more. So these spheres kind of move away as you as they institute these different treatments and competition. The main take home points here are that there is a response in the niche use. There seems to be divergence. Um, but again, interspecific competition doesn't have similar effects as intraspecific competition. So again, inter and intraspecific competition have different effects on niche area. Again, not what they anticipated that they would see. This one's a little easier to deal with, uh, thankfully. So figure three just looks at the growth rate of these fish. Now we've got all of the kinds of treatments on here again. They don't have in, they didn't have intraspecific competition in earlier figures in figure one, but they've got it here. So we've got the fish grown by itself or with higher levels of intraspecific competition. No differences, so no asterisk, no change. Uh, grown competing against other species. Again, the, um, the response here is the growth rate of the fish. So they grow a, a little slower, but not statistically slower in all of these other conditions. The only time the growth rate of the fish is really reduced is in these cases where interspecific competition is especially strong. And that's fairly consistent across all three of the species. So if you have a look at tench, and then carp, and then goldfish, it's only real strong interspecific competition
that slows the growth rate of these fish. So the conclusion of this figure is that, first of all, all the fish grew, so that's good. If the growth rate was way down here at zero, it means that during the time of the experiment, the fish didn't grow. So they all grew. They all had positive growth. So that much is kind of good. It, it suggests that their experiment worked okay and the fish were, you know, getting by. Um, but the most important take home from these panels is that lower growth is only at the highest or second highest um, uh, interspecific competition treatments. So this, again, is relevant to prediction number one, that interspecific competition does actually reduce growth. So they had predicted that interspecific competition will alter the size of the niche and reduce growth. Well, they didn't get a change in the size of the niche we saw earlier, but it does reduce growth rate of the fish. So finally, the last thing that they were really interested in was um, is the experimental results that they found um, were they consistent with what they found in the field and it turns out that no sort of disappointingly uh, they they don't show the same outcomes so again we've got that sort of 2d niche of each of these species here they are in the natural setting, so out in those ponds that were naturally invaded by the fish. And here we have the same treatments in an experimental setup. And if you see this ellipse right here, the, the um, dashed ellipse, so this first panel up here is for site one. And in site one, this is tench and this is goldfish. You can see a pretty big divergence in the niche out in the field. But when, you, when they grew those two species together in this experiment, not really the same kind of differentiation. Pretty similar. Moreover, if you look real closely, look at that y-axis here versus the y-axis here. Very different in the experiment versus the natural setting, which suggests that these experimental settings are not really mimicking this particular pond. Maybe that was a particularly low nutrient pond, didn't have a lot of insects in it, or who knows what. In this middle pond, site number two, this is the sphere representing the niche of goldfish, and here is the sphere representing the niche of carp. This is the only one, by the way, where there's a differentiation statistically between these two niches. So they have very different niches in this pond. Grown in an experiment though, pretty good overlap. In other words, the niches are very similar between these two species when grown in the experiment. Finally, site three out in nature, it looks like there's some pretty good uh, divisions between these two, so it looks like these niches are very different, but see that little darker one there and that little darker one there? Even though these spheres look very different, or the ellipses, whatever, even though they look like they're very different, statistically they're not different. They still overlap a bit, so the niches are um, are not statistically different here. Here also, they're they're not statistically different. But I, I guess the authors argue that you know, look, this one shifted up from here. This one kind of shifted up from here, so. The divergence is sort of in the same direction. Here are the three take-home messages from this part of the project. Now remember, this is a not really an experiment. This is more of a natural observation. First of all, there's greater shifts in the niches in natural ponds. They attribute that later on to, you know, maybe these things have been established for much longer and it takes a long time for those niches to split, or maybe the resource levels are different in those ponds versus in the experiment. The only significant difference that they found was in site two, which is this one right here. And then they argue that the directions of these niche shifts were similar across all three cases. And I guess if you squint, you can sort of see that. So here the, the dashed one is lower than the solid one. So again, this is goldfish and this is tench. The dashed one is lower than the solid one. So maybe tench is shifted up a little bit. 
carp is shifted to the right here and it's kind of shifted to the right here um, this is tench here this is carp Sh tench is shifted to the left mm, tench is shifted more upward well I don't know that I buy it uh, it's kind of up to you to determine whether you believe what they conclude here. So for the, that result in uh, figure 4 that we just looked at was relevant to this third prediction was that the experimental populations in the sort of lab settings or in the, in the enclosure settings should be similar to the natural or wild settings. And um, yeah, I think there's some evidence for that, but um, I don't think it's as strong a case as they make it out to be. So let's look at overall conclusions. Um, there's not really any niche shifts in niche size. Uh, competition does impact the niche, but only in cases of real strong interspecific competition. And finally, the overall kind of take home is that there are similar patterns in niche divergence in natural versus experimental communities. So if we revisit the initial questions that really motivated this experiment, the initial question or the purpose of the study was, can we get a better understanding of what happens when a species successfully invades? And then, can we predict natural outcomes with experiments? Remember that this paragraph was the one that kind of set up all of those things. So then it's kind of debatable. Do we understand any better what happens when a species invades successfully? I guess you would argue that successful invasion happened in those natural lakes. Do they have some understanding of what happened there? Yeah, kind of. Uh, at least in some cases there are shifts in these niches. Here's another case where the niches have shift, shifted. And I guess I would also argue that the size of the ellipse here versus here seems kind of similar, although you, we got to keep in mind that the x and y axis values are fairly different. So if we apply those outcomes or, or those results to the initial three kind of conditions that they set up, what they argue is that niche expansion definitely does not happen. I would argue that maybe there's some evidence for niche compression in some of these cases, but probably the strongest evidence that they assert, and, and I agree with, is that the niche shift is probably what's happening the most. So um, whereas they might have overlapped initially in the initial conditions, at least in some um, of the experiments, they've got pretty good evidence that one niche shifts and so does the other one and they kind of diverge a little bit. Certainly there is a decline in growth of the native species, but really that only happens at the very highest levels of interspecific competition. So I think they have the best evidence for this hypothesis uh, on the bottom, although there might be also some evidence here. So what is the importance of this paper to this subdiscipline? Well, I think it gives us a little bit better understanding of what happens when fish invade successfully into communities. I think it um, moves the field a little bit farther in terms of understanding competition and using these isotopic ratios to measure things that have to do with the niche. What is the significance to a broader audience? I don't think they make a real strong case here, but I think they could do a better job of discussing how this has um, a relevance to something beyond just the academic study of competition. So for example, could this help in determining fisheries policy? Um, does it mean that we can stock fisheries much higher than we suspected? Does it mean that we can allow more species to compete because it doesn't really matter? I, I'd like to have some of those predictions um, stated here. Um, and These last things I'm going to leave up to you to try to come up with and maybe we'll discuss them on uh, Friday when we talk about the paper. Um, I've given you a few hints I think along the way uh, for places where we can come up with an alternative interpretation or a critical assessment. One thing you want to keep in mind though is that that 
uh, alternative interpretation needs to be pretty substantial. You need to justify what the alternative interpretation should be. And it should um, tell you something about whether you think their conclusions are valid or not. And finally, they don't really talk a whole lot about what the future direction should be, but maybe you can find some things where they mention it. Now, what would you want to see in terms of the future directions of this paper? And if you're an author for this, uh, I would want to see what the next experiment is that should be conducted along these lines.